today. John, uh, often referred to as the Apostle of Love. Uh, love is a, a dominant theme in John's writings, uh, not only in his uh, three epistles, but also in the Gospel of John. Pastor Clifford Stewart of Louisville, Kentucky, sent his parents a microwave oven one Christmas. Here's how he recalls the experience. They were excited that now they too could be part of the instant generation. When dad unpacked the microwave and plugged it in, literally within seconds, the microwave transformed two smiles into a frown. Even after reading the directions, they couldn't make it work. Two days later, my mother was playing bridge with a friend and confessed her inability to get that microwave even to boil water. To get this darn thing to work, she exclaimed, I really don't need better directions. I just needed my son to come along with the gift. <clears throat> We're going to talk about love this morning, and it is a most essential gift and far more important than a kitchen appliance. And the good news about this gift is that the son comes with the gift. <laughs> As we look at the fact that Jesus Christ's coming means that we receive the gift of love. Let's go to our text. 1 John 4, 7 through 13. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, 
God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. How many of you love to give gifts? Anyone? Yeah? Are, are, are there more people that enjoy receiving them than giving them? <laughs> I, I think sometimes of the, the anticipation, particularly on a particularly large gift, um, my wife is a great person to give a gift to. Because you might have noticed that at times my wife can get excited. She gets exuberant. Uh, and if she gets a great gift and it really surprised her and she really loves it, she explodes. Um, I will tell you, one of, the, one of the things I enjoy the most in life is on those rare occasions where I actually make my wife happy and see her joy. There's just something so fulfilling about seeing her so excited, so, it's just awesome. I love it. A couple of years ago, it was one of those, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, water cooler, you know, you get the big jug at Walmart, you refill it, whatever you put it on, put it in there, and we have fresh, you know, spring water to drink all the time. You'd think that's just a, a a nice item, whatever, a necessary item, whatever. Oh, she just went bananas. Anyway. I see those commercials where a husband surprises his wife with a vehicle in the driveway, you know. Anyone ever done that? Anyone? Ron, you did? Wow. Was it a Matchbox car or was it a... We're driving. Wow. She didn't know it. Nice. I, I can just imagine. She was a little upset that day. <laughs> 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 Ryan, right, you sabotaged your own gift giving experience. Wow. I, I know that my wife would mind me buying a new car, but I guarantee you she'd want to be the one who picked it. And she'd want to know how we're paying for this. And the, she writes the checks. Merry Christmas! Have fun with this one. Um, I've often wondered that that you know that 15 second commercial looks really grand, and everybody's oh, I got you this car. Well, guess what? I got you this car. <laughs> and they don't show you that you know hundred and some thousand dollars they are now in debt. Anyway, we're going to be talk, talking about the greatest gift that was given, uh, and I want to look at three things today. I, I was talking to my brother last night and I was talking about my sermon because he usually asked me and I said, well, my three points are, he said, oh, what a novel idea, a pastor with three points. I said, shut up. <laughs> so, we're going to look at a gift given, a gift to be given, and a gift that keeps on giving. So let's go ahead and take a look at this gift given. 1 John 4, 9 and 10 out of our text. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We, we all have all kinds of ideas about what love is, don't we? And I do fear that too often our idea of love is some, something that we do to get something that we want. Usually there's some kind of string. Um, not always, but I think a lot of times we have strings. And just try this. If, you, if, you, if you're not sure about this, just think of times maybe, Brad, you gave flowers to your, to your wife, and she didn't respond as emphatically as you thought she would, and you got a little upset. That means there were some strings attached. You're giving because you want a particular response back. But this idea of genuine love is this idea that I give whether I get a response back or not. That's the kind of love that God gave, right? A lot of our presents have those, those strings. We give a kind word, a flower, a box of chocolates to our spouse. We expect a big fuss. We don't get it. And then we're upset. But if we'd given the gift genuinely not giving to get something in return, we wouldn't be so insistent that they make a fuss. God gives his gift of love. And that gift is really himself, right? God gave his very son 
the greatest gift possible. He gave that gift to people who did not deserve it, to people who could not reciprocate the same gift back to him. How many of you have had that experience? You want to just give somebody a gift, and they can't just receive it. Oh, i got to get you something. Well, I didn't give it to you, so you'd give me something. I just wanted to give you the gift. And they simply can't just receive unless they try to give something that's of equal value back. They don't want to be in anybody's debt. Can we give back to the Lord the same level of gift that he's given us? It's not possible. It's not, couldn't, couldn't possibly do it. He gives to those who are undeserving, who could not reciprocate the same gift back, who were, quite honestly, unthankful, ungrateful, and ungodly. And listen to how John describes this gift. This gift of love is not about us loving God. It's about the fact that he loved us. The real gift is that it is for those who cannot even remotely do anything to deserve it or give back anything of comparable worth. Think of the hymn, In the Bleak Midwinter. Now, we're, we, we, we sing that, right? And it's a beautiful carol. <clears throat> but I want you to think theologically about these words. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what I, what I can, I give him, give my heart. And we think, hey, that's pretty good of me. I'm giving, I'm giving the Lord my heart. That's quite the gift, is it? What kind of heart do you think you're giving him? You ever think about that? Well, I gave him my heart. Your, your heart, okay? Was it pure? Was it a holy heart? Is it the kind of heart that he requires? Because Jeremiah 17, 9 says something about our heart. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Some translations say desperately wicked. Who can understand it? That's what you gave? Does, does that reciprocate equal value to what he's given you? <laughs> and that's why John can say, this is love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us. That's the real, that's the real gift. The idea that God would love us, incredible. What a gift. That we would love him, well, that's kind of a no-brainer, right? The thing that's amazing is not that we would love him, but rather that he would love us in the first place. That's the real gift. That's the real amazing thing. Not that we love God, but that he loved us, and John says, and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In other words, the gift God gave is for people who were so wretched that God's son had to be killed to satisfy the wrath of God that we're under. The propitiation he's talking about, that's the payment for our wickedness. And so, what a gift. He pays our debt. Now, how many of you have debt that for Christmas you'd like somebody to pay? Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> Some hands go up quicker than others on that one. Probably, maybe your debt is bigger. <laughs> right? Maybe it's a mortgage. Maybe it's some other kind of debt. You say, boy, if somebody would just come along and pay that, that would be a real nice Christmas present. But imagine that God sent his son to pay your biggest debt, which is your sin debt against him, and declare you righteous. That's a gift. That's a gift. There's no greater gift of love than that the Savior laid down his life for ours. He did not do it so that we would give him something of equal value. We don't have such a thing to give. He did it so that we could be forgiven and live in him. And in fact, ultimately, his perfect demonstration of love is for his glory. God is glorified in the gift that Christ gave. We live for his glory. We receive his gift of love. He gains all the glory. Our heart that we give him, sorry, that's not the prize. The glory that he receives for his great love, that is the prize. And I think if we were to truly grasp the magnitude of his perfect gift, we would also see that our efforts at being made right with God by our own works are insulting to the giver of the gift of our salvation. You can't buy it. You can't work for it. You just need to receive it. 
You can't reciprocate. You can't give a gift back of equal value. You just need to humble yourself and receive it. It's interesting. One of the most difficult things for people in coming to Christ is the fact that it's too easy. Well, I've got to do this, and I've got to do this work, and that work, and I've got... No, you need to just receive it. That's it. And they stumble over something that is so simple. They don't want to receive it. I, I think I've told this story before. We church in Connecticut where we'd get the soup away at our Maple Fest every year. And people would come in, and, and they had previously sold it, but then we started giving it away, and they said, uh, why are you doing this? And we said, we just want you to understand how the love of God works. It's free. And people would say, well, here's a 20. And I'd say, and I, and I would kind of have fun with it, but I would say that, you know, ma'am, you put that bunny back in your pocket, I'm calling the cops, you know, or I'd, I'd say whatever. But I'd say, and, why, and, and they would get, why can't I give you money? I want to support the church. I said, listen, the moment you give me money, this is no longer a gift. It's now a purchase. And you can't buy the soup. It's only free. And I want you to understand how God's gift works. That's how salvation works. If you want to buy it, you can't have it. If you'll take it for free, you can have it all. That's how it works. The gift that is given is the perfect gift of God's love. How about that gift to be given? What in the world could I possibly mean by that? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to look at a few different verses here. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And then I want to jump down to verses 11 and 12. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Even though we cannot give an adequate gift to our Savior, we are instructed that we are to be gift givers. What's the gift to be given? God's love to one another. He says, love one another. Love is from God. You've received that love. Now you also ought to love one another. So there's the gift given to us. We've received that gift of God's love. Now there's a gift to be given. And that is a continual gift of love we give to other people. <coughs> Bob Hope. How many of you remember that guy? Yeah. Bethany? Yeah. That's what I thought. He said, my idea of Christmas, whether old-fashioned or modern, is very simple, loving others. Come to think of it, why do we have to wait for Christmas to do that? Well said, right? <laughs> Certainly shouldn't have to wait for Christmas to be loving to one another. Some people wait even longer than that, I think. Um, love is that gift that is to be given. And Bob Hope is right. Why do we have to wait for Christmas to start that? We need to see our act of giving love to others as the gift that God wants us to be giving all the time. So here's the deal. We've received the gift of God. We've received love. Therefore, we ought to give the gift of love to others. And I think we make a mistake when we attempt to follow God's command to be the one who offers a gift of love to others. We forget just how extravagant God's love truly was. You see... We tend to only love certain people. Who do we who do we tend to love? Anyone? Family. Family? What was it? I heard another. One. No. How about people that love us? Right? Pretty easy to love people that love you already. Those are the people we and we think of who's on my list of people to get gifts for, right? We don't think of, hmm. I wonder what that list of people down there at that prison is. Maybe I get some gifts there. I know that I know that relative of mine that I haven't talked to in 15 years and I have a grudge against and say all kinds of hateful things behind her back. I'm probably going to get them a gift and um, see if I can find some other reprobates and give them a no. no, we find people that already are loving to us and we love them and we say, well, look at me, I'm being loving. But we, are, we need to, to back up and remember the kind of gift that we received. God's gift of love 
Was it to loving people who already loved him? Nope. Was it to very good, godly, righteous people? Nope. Was it to rebels and reprobates and people who violated his law and trampled upon his holiness? Yep. So who do you think you ought to love if it's saying you've received his love, now love one another? What kind of love do you think it ought to be and who ought who should that love go to? You see, God's love was given to rebels, to sinners, to reprobates, evildoers, murderers, ungrateful, unloving, undeserving, ungodly enemies of God himself. That's who his love went to. He did not give his love to the lovely. We attempt to offer love to those whom we think are deserving. We put qualifications on whom to give love to that God did not use in giving love to us. He didn't put those qualifications. He didn't put those restrictions. I love this story. It's right here from Pennsylvania. In the grace of giving, Stephen Olford tells of a Baptist pastor during the American Revolution, Peter Miller, who lived in Effort of Pennsylvania and enjoyed the friendship of George Washington. In Ephrata also lived Michael Whitman, an evil-minded sort who did all he could to oppose and humiliate the pastor. One day, Michael Whitman was arrested for treason and sentenced to die. Peter Miller traveled 70 miles on foot to Philadelphia to plead for the life of the traitor. No, Peter, General Washington said, I cannot grant you the life of your friend. My friend, exclaimed the old preacher, he's the bitterest enemy I have. What, cried Washington, you've walked 70 miles to save the life of an enemy? That puts the matter in a different light. I'll grant your pardon, and he did. Peter Miller took Michael Whitman back home to effort of no longer an enemy, but a friend. That's the kind of love we're talking about, okay? Look at it this way. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus says, but love your enemies. Yikes, that doesn't sound easy, does it? <laughs> and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. <laughs> How many of you, you have tools and your neighbor borrows them? That's what this verse is talking about. Lend, expecting nothing in return. <laughs> and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Wow. Can you imagine what would happen if we started intentionally loving the ones who deserve love the least? I imagine some great things could happen from that. What do you think? A great gift has been given, and we are the ones who are to be given, giving that gift to others. So a gift is given. There's a gift to be given. That's what we give. And then I want to talk about this idea of a gift that keeps on giving. Now, I can imagine there are a, a handful of people, when I said the words, a gift that keeps on giving, you had an image in your head, and it was this one. Anyone? Brad? You've never seen Christmas Vacation. I've seen it. But this didn't come to mind. No. Nope. We're going to talk later. <laughs> So, for those of you who have never seen this fine classic Christmas film, Clark, played by Chevy Chase, opens his Christmas bonus expecting a huge monetary check. When he opens the envelope, it reveals that he received a one-year membership to the Jelly of the Month Club, to which Cousin Eddie, the man in the lovely sweater here, says, Ah, Clark, that's the gift that keeps on giving the whole year. So what, what could John possibly be talking about in 1 John that keeps on giving all the time? 1 John 4, verse 13, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. You see, it would have been one thing if all that God did was to grant us salvation. If, if all we ever received from God was the gift of our sins forgiven and then he left us alone until we go to heaven, that would have been far more than we deserve. We would have been uh, grateful the rest of our days until we spend our eternity with him, right? 
if he just kind of gave us salvation and left us alone. But he didn't do that, did he? Sadly, I think to some, he gives salvation, and after salvation, they leave him alone. But that's not his response. He doesn't leave us alone. But in fact, he has given us a gift that keeps on giving, and that's his Holy Spirit. Think back to the Christmas gifts that you've had over the years. I want you to go way back, okay? Marshall, if you'll be willing to play along with me here. Go way back in your mind. What are some gifts that you, as a kid, you said, I have to have this gift, I want this gift. You got a, a particular gift for Christmas that was very special to you. Can you remember any? Well, we have the train set. Train set. Okay, that's an excellent answer. Anybody else? Go back in your, your earliest days that you can remember. What's a gift that you got that was just best gift ever? Christmas gift. A kayak. Huh? A kayak. Kayak. Okay. All right. That's a good one. Puppy. A puppy. Okay, that's excellent. I got a Tully doll that you could give a perm to. Okay, a doll you could give a perm to. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I wish Dino was here to hear that. She'd get a kick out of that. Anybody else? I shotgun if I ever got You wanted to still waiting. You would have, you would have probably shot that, that doll and you get the burn again. Yeah, club. A hunting knife. Hunting knife, yeah. I, I just got a hunting knife the other day because I went uh, I went hunting with Bob Hunter and I shot the deer and then he, he gutted it for me and then um, the, the next day Hey, Pastor, I got you a gift, and he got me a knife so that I get to gut the next one. Anyway. <laughs> so, all of those gifts, here's the, here's the sad, sad, sad truth about all those gifts. Okay, is that puppy still alive? No. Marshall, do you know where that train set is? I have no idea. Yeah? Where's that, where's that perm making doll? In the garbage. In the garbage. And we're not even going to talk about your shotgun because you never got it. Um, your kayak you probably still have, no? Okay. But when you go back over the years and you think about that train that you had to have and it was so awesome, you certainly did enjoy it, but at some point either it breaks or you lose it or you lose interest in it. You get the puppy, really sad reality is that it's, it only lives so many years, right? And it's gone. And, and we can think of all kinds of, of toys and gifts and that, that, that eight track player you had to have, you know, that, that uh, top of the line, high fidelity uh, eight track player that you can't find eight tracks for anymore. The new outhouse, right? Eventually it rotted and fell down. Material gifts that we receive wear out, fall apart, break, deteriorate, become obsolete. They don't last. But the gift of the Spirit is a gift that keeps on giving. He does not leave us. He does not forsake us. When He gave us the gift of His love, He also gave us the gift of His Spirit that is a gift that keeps on giving the entire life of the believer. Isn't that incredible? It is a gift that keeps on giving. When it comes to giving the gift of love to others, it is the Holy Spirit that enables us to do that. Isn't that interesting? So God gives the greatest gift. He gives his gift of love to us. Then he wants us to give that gift of love to others. And he says, well, you're going to have a hard time doing that because it's not easy to love others, particularly the ones I'm calling you to love. So I'll, I'll go ahead and give you my Holy Spirit who will help you to do it. Not bad. Not bad. Galatians 5, 16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then verse 22, as he describes the fruit of the Spirit, he describes those things that start to appear in our lives. What? Because we've been given the Spirit. What are those things? Let's look at the very, very first one on the list. There it is. Love. There it is. The fruit of the Spirit is love. In other words, out, out of the life of a believer that has Christ born in them, what should grow out of what's been born in them, what should start to pop out of them and, and, and expose itself to love. It's the Spirit that does that work. So God doesn't call you to do something that He doesn't give you the Spirit to empower you to give you the ability to do it. 
Not too bad. I kind of like this, this gift of love thing. Not, not too shabby. A gift given, the love of Christ. A gift to be given, Christ's love to others. And a gift that keeps on giving, the Holy Spirit. Some pretty incredible gifts of love. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of love that we have received. We thank you that you've given your very self. We thank you that the gift, the gift that came, came with the Son. Lord, help us to love others as you've called us to, and we thank you that you've given your spirit to enable us to do exactly that. Help us to walk in step with that Holy Spirit that you've given so that we may please you and no longer gratify the desires of the flesh. Thank you for your word this morning, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen.